Good morning, everybody. Uh, really pleased to be hosting this special workshop. Um, I'm Paul Beckley. I work for the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. We are really pleased to be part of the Net Zero Festival. And this is a, an interesting uh, session to kick us off. So it's a sunny morning here in Cambridge and we're excited to be um, speaking with you today. And the purpose of this is to explore effective boards in a carbon constrained world. And with me, we have three speakers who will share their experience. We're going to be talking about the capabilities and capacities of boards to lead organizations in a carbon constrained world. We're going to be looking at um, what will be required for businesses to grow and succeed whilst delivering net zeros. Is that actually possible? And we'll be looking at some of those uh, tricky issues that often we um, are aware exist within large organizations, but actually uh, are sometimes just overlooked. And so this should be a, a challenging and engaging hour. We're hopeful that the IT will be smooth and things will run really uh, incredibly well, but I know that we're all um, 20 months or so into a a COVID pandemic and actually we're experienced um, in terms of Zoom and we've all had that terrible situation whereby things have not gone quite well. But today let's cross our fingers and uh, embark on our journey together. We are going to just share some slides and we are just hopeful that uh, this all runs really smoothly. So I have been working with the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability for a decade. And in that time, I've worked with a whole host of boards representing different sorts of organisations, whether that's NGOs, or whether that's uh, development banks, whether that's the military, whether that's large corporates. And everyone has very similar but quite different issues. And it's a real privilege to engage with boards. And so we're trying to share with you um, some of those insights uh, today with the hope that we can come up with uh, an understanding about what we need to have for effective boards in carbon constrained work. I work for a department of the University of Cambridge. Sadly, this is not our office in, on the screen, but actually this is King's College. And for 800 years, the university has been at the frontier of trying to drive change. The biggest change that we collectively have is the transition to net zero. What we're hoping is that um, we could just take a moment just to invite you to share some initial reflections with us by logging into menti.com and using this code, which is on screen. And what we'll see is we'll see your views about to what extent boards are equipped to lead their organization in a carbon constrained world. So if you grab a phone, and I'm sure most of you have a device or some sorts just to hand, just log into Menti and you'll be invited just to complete two questions and um, it should come up smoothly. And I'm really hopeful this is gonna work uh, perfectly. And our tests this morning have uh, given us a nice scoring system. So hopefully that'll go quite well. And generally what we find when we talk to people is that they think that they as a board are able to lead the organization into a carbon constrained world, but they don't hold a lot of faith that other boards will be able to lead. And so it'll be interesting um, to see how this uh, question answers and we'll just keep this open for a while. Um, so the code is at the top, the website's at the top. I'm hopeful that that will run smoothly, but just um, to take a step back and just to uh, remind ourselves about how organizations have changed. And this is really important because actually the nature of the organization is often perceived to be quite hierarchical, quite uh, clear. Um, the people at the top of the board, have control. 
When we go to business schools, we're told that this is what leadership looks like. This is a slide that I took from a, a chief executive friend of mine, Gareth Llewellyn. And actually, the reality is that this is not true. This is just not true, especially in a COVID world whereby we're all reflected on Zoom with the same size box. And we can have informal conversations. And actually, we're living in network organizations. A few years ago, IBM spoke about the globally integrated single person enterprise. And this is a conversation killer, but actually it's really important. Anyone on this call is a globally integrated single person enterprise. And that's quite interesting because it has a profound implication on leadership, but also on the nature of the board. The power dynamics of a globally integrated world mean that leadership doesn't look like what we have on the slide, but it looks a lot more like this. This is how it feels. This is chaotic. There is no one who has carefully worked out how to prepare for a pandemic. What would happen if suddenly people couldn't come into the office? Leadership feels like this. And that's really important because actually organizations operate like this and the transition to net zero will require coherence. It will require strategic thinking, it will require long-termism. But at the same time, we have this leadership dilemma. So this is the nature of our conversation today. And actually in that conversation, we have Carol, who is delightful. And we have been lucky enough to work with Carol for a long time. We will come and invite Carol just to introduce herself in a moment or two. We have Antoine, and Antoine has been with us for a long time. He's worked with Earth on board. And before we come to Antoine, let us just go to Philippe Joubert. So Philippe corrected me recently when I said, gosh, Philippe, you were a president of Alstom Power. And he said, no, I was president and CEO. And this is important. And what's really important is that we're honest with one another and that we're engaging with one another. And actually he held me to account and indeed he has been an expert in thinking about board dynamics, thinking about the transition to net zero, but also how we can create earth competent boards. So let me just uh, pause with my screen sharing um, and come to Philippe. Good morning, Philippe. It's super that you can join us from Paris. And I would just like to um, invite you just to say a little bit about uh, what you think net zero means for a company. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Perhaps before I jump into your question, uh, I will spend a few minutes to, to, to give the set the scene and to bring a little order in the chaos that you have uh, very brightly described as usual. Uh, why are we talking about that? Why are we together? Uh, first, because uh, we are very pleased to have been invited uh, for this kind of uh, round table and discussion. But secondly, I think because um, suddenly we are becoming conscious of uh, a few things. Um, when you look at business, as long as far as I look in the past, we have always been doing business taking nature for granted and unlimited. And this is as how I have been doing business and most of the people have been doing business. And what is interesting is that uh, science has already reached a conclusion that we are reaching the boundaries, but nature is sending signal very clear. And uh, this summer we have had all across the world and particularly in Europe, which was not that often, uh, received this kind of, of, of signals. Um, when you look back in 2015, I think that Paris Agreement, I am not talking uh, about that because I am in Paris today, but Paris was really a landmark in this, uh, in this uh, new world. Paris Agreement normally is seen as a temperature agreement uh, talking about 1.5, 2 degrees, etc. But if you really look at the agreement, the, for me at least, the important sentence is you have to reach a net zero world as soon as you can around 50s. Um, 
After this, we had a, a flurry of uh, government and country declaration. I think that today, more or less two thirds of the world uh, GDP uh, has declared at the country level uh, an initiative around net zero. So in 2015, the scene is this one. First, this is a fact. We have reached the planet boundaries or we are reaching. Paris Agreement said you have to go to net zero and countries are going. And the best proof of this is that the next COP in Glasgow is all around net zero. Um, and why is it meaningful for business? You could say countries are saying this, fine, let them talk and, uh, and continue to live the way we have been doing business. Uh, what is meaningful for business is because in Paris, for the first time, business was seen as a solution. I sometimes say business was not at the table in Paris, but was under the tent. Nothing which is in the agreement has been done without business agreement or even business involvement. Uh, and uh, if you look at the definition of, uh, of net zero, net zero, which is defined at the country level or territory level, you look at the definition and it, it means that it's, uh, you cannot emit more CO2 from your activity that nature is able uh, to absorb. Uh, this simple sentence has put uh, an enormous pressure on the systems. And if you look at what the systems now uh, is, uh, is saying or is the way it's behaving, you have the pressure from science. You have seen the last report of uh, of, uh, on 1.5, which is absolutely overwhelming by the consequence of this. The political statement, as I said before, is all over the world now, and even taking some commitments. And after the commitment at the political level, you have the legal commitment also coming. And this is changing the legal system. And this is probably where the world is changing for business. Business have not yet taken that very clearly into consideration, but law is helping now uh, business to understand their responsibility. And there are plenty of cases where business are responsible either because they have uh, contributed to this uh, inflow of CO2, but also uh, make other suffer consequences and they are being attacked uh, legally. The financial market is coming now, uh, not because they are altruistic, but because they understood that as they are uh, systemic, the system is in danger and their profit and their risk is too high. So, and the, the money is moving. So when the money is moving, obviously business sees that their funds, the way they are financing their operation uh, is different. And they are receiving the, the pressure from the investors. Front runners, are putting pressure on their own supply chain and their own value chain because they are all understand, understand, understood that this is not a question only for the, the between the two walls of, of a business. And more importantly, as you're going to see later uh, with Antoine, uh, a new generation of consumer, of employees are behaving differently. And so the resources also of the company are under pressure because the young talent doesn't want to behave the same way. So when you have a change in risk, a change in opportunities, because this is opening a whole new uh, flow of opportunity for business and a change in the behavior of the resources, you are pretty sure that you are in front of what we call in our jargon, a constellation of disruption, which is close to this uh, chaos that you have designed, where a lot of pressure are coming and nourishing each other to create the perfect storm. So what the business is doing in this case, reaching the point of your question, very simply, we are making declaration and fabulous declaration. We are all net zero. And then this is what I will, uh, I will now uh, go uh, into a small detail, so more details. Uh, I don't have the right number because this is increasing every day. So at the moment, the, we are saying between 15% or 20% of the GDP, business representing 20% of the G world GDP have declared a kind of net zero, uh, net zero uh, commitment. 
But, and then I'm sure we'll come back during the conversation, they are with different time uh, horizon. Some are 2050, some are saying, hey, leave me alone till 2049, come back and you will see how we'll be net zero in 2050. Some others are a little more reasonable and giving a, a pathway, but not all. Different scope. Scope one, which is the, the emission, scope two, emission imported for energy, and scope three, or part of scope three, or with, with uh, intensity, all the scopes are also very different. They are very different transformation pathway, inclusive, exclusive, competitive, etc. And more importantly, as you obviously know, declaration is not action. So this is more or less uh, where we are at the moment uh, for business. And then, do you want to make the, the, the survey now or you want to, me to answer the second question also, where, where you want? Let us uh, just unpack a little bit of what you just said there, Philippe. So capital is on the move. This is um, kind of a very dynamic space. I think um, kept this moving target of how many organizations have committed to net zero is really important. And it is changing almost on a daily basis as we run up to the um, convention of the parties in Glasgow. But I, I wondered if you could just say a little bit more explicitly about kind of what net zero would mean for a company. Does it? Yeah. So, but the main question, I think, before we do that, because I think Carol and Antoine uh, will have also an interesting point of view on this, but uh, before we do that, we defend the idea that it could be difficult uh, to use net zero at the level of the company, because net zero was defined at the level of a country or territory, but can we really use net zero at the level of a company? Uh, we we reached the conclusion uh, after having studied all what uh, the difficulty and also the declaration that we are seeing all around the world now, we reached the conclusion that uh, net zero is at least minimum questionable and probably improper to be used at the business level. Uh, as I will explain, uh, we can certainly continue to use net zero as a company contributing to a net zero world, but the company has a lot of difficulty to be net zero. And uh, if uh, if uh, you you take only four points of uh, question and doubt, first because of the lack of clarity, uh, as I have said, uh, when you look at all declarations that have been done on net zero, they are all with different scope. Uh, they don't allow to compare company between themselves. Take the oil and gas, for example. Most of them are net zero at the moment. Recently, you had Shell, Total, uh, and BP, just to take the three, your three Europeans that have declared net zero. They are all different scope. They are all partial scope. And none of them will really be net zero across their value chain. So they are all different, and it's a really lack of clarity. The timing is not the same. The measurement is not there, and the, 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 the pathway is not clear. So you see that this uh, uh, element of, uh, of comparison is not there. It's misleading. Why do we say it's misleading? First, because most of them are including uh, uh, compensation or offset. And we all know that it's difficult to, it's nearly impossible to compensate emission certain today with an offset which is uncertain in a different uh, time horizon. Uh, and it can give a false sense of achievement to the rest of the, com of the community, saying, okay, this company are net zero, we can sleep quietly, nothing will happen to us, the company are taking care of, of, of future. We know which is also totally insufficient because uh, we, we know that uh, an, uh, uh, a company anyway cannot be net zero and uh, an offset of, uh, is not uh, a good answer for 
the diminution that is absolutely necessary, a decrease absolutely necessary in the emission. Uh, and it's not maximizing action, finally. First, because it's a very good tool for procrastination, saying, okay, let's, let's continue to sleep well and we will do something uh, tomorrow. And it's giving an unfair economic advantage to the economic power of a certain sector. And it's probably too easy and too cheap uh, to compensate uh, emission with uh, offsets that are uh, widely available. So that's why we say that company uh, cannot uh, be net zero, but must contribute to a net zero world. This is provocative. Very yeah, sure. Deep. Yeah, you, you want to talk, yeah. I, and I think there are functionalities for the participants to begin to ask questions. And I think this is a really interesting statement and set of thoughts that we've heard from Philippe. And this builds on um, a whole host of expertise that you have had both working with Cambridge and also in your role at Earth on Board, as well as your previous experience of being um, a business leader. And this is incredibly important. And earlier we polled people in terms of uh, how effective and how capable they thought that um, boards currently are at uh, moving towards net zero. I understand that we've had a small technical challenge with some of the uh, polling data, but most people have come back or the respondents all cluster around um, the issue of not really um, have <laughs> indicating that boards are not very well equipped to lead their organizations in the carbon constrained world. And in many ways, I'm not surprised at all. And partly that might be, as Philippe, Philippe says, the issue of uh, net zero is very hard at the board level, but also that perhaps this is a new um, way of thinking that we need within the board. And I wondered, as we move uh, forward, maybe we can just invite Carol to come and say some uh, thoughts about you know, the work that she was doing and the work that she is doing as a non-executive director, but also formerly in her role at Heathrow. And we were lucky enough to engage with some of your team for a long time, Carol. And I wondered if you could just uh, share some reflections on how Net Zero played out in the boards that you're working with and in your time at Heathrow. So okay. good morning, Carol. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Paul. I'm really delighted to be here with uh, you all. Um, uh, before I talk about net zero, I'll just reflect on what Paul said earlier about leadership and how um, uh, in a sort of chaotic diagram, it showed that leadership doesn't actually just uh, rest with the board as such, but with everyone. I think at Heathrow, we recognize that and we invested uh, several years actually into a program called sustainability leadership uh, so that we try to get everyone to see that each individual is a, a sustainability leader um, and to uh, not just concentrate on the short term, but to have a long term outlook on things and not only to focus on uh, financial gains for the shareholders, because for years we were doing that, but actually to look at the wider um, aspect of the um, ESG goals, uh, the environment, the social aspects. And um, it's good that um, the Companies Act in the UK have uh, gone along with this so that um, the obligations on boards and companies is much wider than purely financial. And uh, you would all probably are very familiar with Section 172 um, of the Companies Act, which actually um, requires people to take uh, that wider view. Uh, so at Heathrow, we were uh, working on this and we actually also worked with um, uh, or actually took lessons more, more likely from uh, CISL uh, to learn from other organizations as to how they uh, do things um, well and so that we could um, uh, copy them um, uh, with, with uh, some humility, I guess. Um, so at, um, at Heathrow, uh, 
when when Philippe was talking about uh, can an organization actually be net zero, um, we ourselves uh, have set around the task of trying to be carbon free or carbon neutral or net zero, whatever the term is, uh, as far as our own infrastructure is concerned. And we've been on that journey for decades, actually. And uh, we were able to do that even before COVID struck. But that is meaningless because, as Philippe was saying, this is a much wider issue. Um, for an airport, um, being net zero only means 5% really, because all the emissions are really in the air, it's uh, with the airlines. So that's 90, accounts for 95% of carbon emissions. So what is the role for Heathrow Airport then? I mean, we recognize that um, climate change is, and carbon emissions are basically an existential issue for aviation. And so we try to occupy um, the role of at least a convening power to start off with. And, um, uh, and nowadays, airlines um, are very much at the forefront as well. So we work with them to try and see if we could find solutions to this, either in the um, area of uh, cleaner engines um, or alternatives to uh, fossil fuels. So for example, um, really looking into uh, sustainable aviation fuels um, uh, to try to advocate the um, government to create a mandate um, for the use of sustainable aviation fuels um, to a large extent uh, by 2030 uh, and beyond. Um, because actually the infrastructure is already there. You don't need to um, build new things as such. You could put in the same tank um, uh, biofuels uh, in fossil fuel tanks. So that's actually very convenient. So those are some of the things that uh, we have been uh, uh, working on. And um, on the public policy side, we have been engaging with government and it's really important to have that voice. And uh, our CEO, um, uh, John Holland Kay, has been a particularly strong advocate and he personally is very passionate about uh, climate change. So we're very lucky um, uh, to have him as our spokesman. So that's actually just a, a, a thumbnail sketch of what we've been doing at Heathrow. Paul. That's really super. Thank you, Carol. And I think that's really interesting in terms of um, calibrating our thinking to where we can really have a, a significant impact on the transition to a um, net zero future. Because actually, often organisations are part of a value chain whereby carbon might be outside of their direct influence. But actually, maybe you could just say a little bit, Carol, about um, kind of how you're engaging with um, some of the industry associations and some of the other organizations in order to tackle the uh, aviation challenge. Okay, um, I think as I mentioned, sort of being a convening power is quite an important thing. So it's working with the airline industry, with other airports, um, also working with um, uh, the public policy makers, which are re really important and influencers. Uh, because I think all of this, it's in everyone's interest to try and reduce uh, carbon emissions from flying. Because flying itself actually isn't an evil thing. Um, I think uh, aviation just per se um, has got a lot of benefits. It brings cultures together. Um, it actually expands our knowledge. Uh, it gets aid to where uh, overseas countries there, there needs to be aid, for example. It actually increases trade and makes the world a smaller place. So flying actually isn't necessarily the the, the evil as such, it's carbon that is the, the issue. Um, and what we're trying to do is, um, or at Heathrow have been doing, is to try and gather lots of agencies together. Um, uh, and, and I think the will is definitely there. It's about getting a few um, uh, uh, voices within government uh, who could start sort of making those policy changes. And in fact, I think um, uh, the government currently 
actually recognizes that and have um, uh, put together a Jet Zero Council. Uh, and I think there is an aviation sector, which um, uh, we have a representative at Heathrow who uh, sits uh, as a leader on that council as well. So there are lots of different bodies, um, uh, you know, very willing to participate. Um, if anything, I think um, sometimes uh, we just want to see more pace uh, because everyone is talking about it. We just want to see um, action now um, more than anything. So hopefully that helps, Paul. Thank you, Carol. I think it's really important because I, I think a lot of the boards that we work with are realising that they're having to form those different types of collaboration and that they're needing to find peers and individuals who can work differently and drive change um, across the ecosystem. And this leads us to the second instalment of our uh, session this morning, which is kind of looking at some of those characteristics that we think will be more and more popular within boards. And I understand that some people joining on certain devices may have seen this question already in our mentee, but what we're going to do is we're going to go back into the screen share and hopefully we're going to see something which um, is new, but in a moment, I'll just put my slide up and uh, here it is. And we're going to go and we're going to ask the question, um, what characteristics will be needed for a board to be successful? And we've just indicated from our first poll that most people think that boards are not equipped to lead to a carbon constrained future. So I just invite you to go to menti.com and I hope you can see that clearly. Um, menti.com and use the code which is on screen in order to share with us some of your views about uh, the characteristics and the traits and the attributes that will be needed for a board to be successful. And then we'll come just to have a look at the word cloud of that in a moment or two. Whilst you're doing that, and I would encourage you just to uh, take a moment just to reflect on that, let us hear from Antoine. And Antoine, um, you're, you're offering a different perspective. I just wondered, um, since you've been working uh, with Philippe in particular since um, the Paris arrangement, you've been quite active as a young climate activist and you're working with a lot of networks in and around that space. And one of the issues that we see quite a lot with the work that we do with boards is have people trying to work out the needs and expectations of a younger generation. What is the value of uh, this? And um, how do you see that issue of intergenerational responsibility uh, playing out in the work that you're doing? Yeah. Hey, thanks, Paul. I'm delighted to participate to this discussion. Um, maybe a thing to mention is that um, I'm involved in what we could call climate activist organizations, but I'm also um, working a lot and discussing a lot with the networks of alumni of various engineering and business school. And you see that the issue of climate and environment is really mainstream. Uh, within those uh, those networks and so it's not only in the climate activist space that I speak a lot about uh, how the younger generation engage within their companies and how they try to participate to that change but it's really within all the network of alumni of engineering law and business schools that have contacts with uh, in France and I think you you would find the same in UK or, or other countries uh, from Europe uh, the participants are from. Um, to, to answer your question, um, I think there is a lot of value uh, for boards today to, to engage with the younger generation, and I will focus more on how they can engage with the young professionals uh, within their, for, their firm. Um, the first value, I think, is really about, on a strategic level, understanding uh, the context, what is changing, and you, you, you showed that picture of the chaos. Of, of what we are facing today. And I think the younger generation, they just bring another view of that, um, of that context and then can also have, I think when you, you, you start to engage with them and discuss with them, they really want to, to have the big picture. They're not only like defending their cause of we are the, 
the young generation and as young people hear our, our desires and what we think, and that's the true thing. They really are, as I view them, in a position of saying, we want to understand what the big con context is to understand what are the expectations of all the groups within society and not only like representing uh, the, young, the, the young generation, but seeing what's the di dynamic currently and how we view um, how the environmental and social issues we evolve, what are the main trends once we compute in not only our view of the younger generation, but all the view of stakeholders. I think they're really in that um, aspect of society is complex. There are a lot of, of interest. And as young people, we want things to change. So we need to understand what is the global context. And I think they can bring that to, to the board as, as young people today. Uh, the second thing is when you engage with people within the firm, uh, young professional, usually they have more, they are more used to collective in intelligence, um, I think processes, and they also are less um, maybe censored by the function they, they are from and, um, and the specific um, work within the firm. I think what I, what I have seen uh, with the, um, the various um, professional uh, professional networks uh, of young people I, I worked with is that they can really better overcome the internal barriers between the, the various function of the firm that their uh, older, um, older colleagues, because they are maybe less attached to the current position they have and they, they are less yeah, entrenched in their career in one specific position and, and what will be the step afterwards. So they are, yeah, I think it's easier for them to bring a, a collective vision and a longer term vision of the company that reflecting on what would be the consequences in the following years for my function, for my role. And so it helps a lot. And the third obvious thing is that really engaging for boards with a uh, younger professional today, it is really um, an extraordinary motivation for the young people. And there are a lot of, of, I was talking about networks of alumni and not really climate activists. The climate activists I'm with, usually they're not within the firms. The alumni, they are working with big, big firms. And a huge share of them are currently asking themselves whether they want to continue within that, that firm, whether it makes sense uh, to, to work for, for such a firm when they see the, the issues, the environmental and, and social issues they are concerned with and offering them a way to, to, to engage with the board, to engage with the higher executives and to show that their concerns on environmental issues are accepted within the firm and that the, the higher executives are, are willing to reflect with them and to hear their voice. It's really a great motivation factor and a great way to, to attract talents. And in France, I have really seen that, uh, working sometimes with younger graduates and they ask the just older counterparts of like five, six years um, older, what, is the company open to that kind of question? Uh, if I join such consultancy firm or such, such industrial company, will I be able to raise my concern and to ask questions and to really have a commission? It's, it's really important for them to, to, to want to join a company. So I think those are at least three main values I see. And as for the, the way to organize this, I think there are lots of different um, perspective. It's really a new thing. So it's kind of iterative, but just to give a few ideas, I think there is both the bottom of approach. Um, the one I, I'm, I'm uh, grounded in is that really young professional within the firm that are concerned, that want to, to start the conversation and that are organizing among themselves to, to conduct a reflection and to try to bring it to the higher executives and to the board. So the first way will be only to, as a board, ask, try to listen to who are already the young professional that are uh, um, reflecting on those issues and that can bring me a vision and help them and show them uh, like the respect and the consideration for what they're doing. And there might be also the way to organize it in a more top-down uh, approach by um, organizing like, how can I uh, meet some people within my, my firm uh, during my board meetings or how I can structure something like a youth board or another formal structure when I give paid time to some young professionals to really reflect on the issues, spend time to organize among themselves. How can I bring, uh, give them a budget to, to have time to 
ask experts outside of the firm to spend time with also management and executives of the various functions of the firm to really understand what the issues. So I think it's quite an iterative process so far and there is not many experiences, but you really have those two bottom up approach and top down because there is already an extraordinary strength of young people within the firm that want to, to engage with boards and executive on environmental matters and climate changes, always almost the, the first issue they want to address. Great, thank you, Antoine. And I think going back to our earlier schematic, this flatter organization poses a whole host of opportunities for people to engage and to exchange but actually it means that we need greater capabilities to listen, adapt and respond. And I, I think this is kind of an interesting piece in terms of how the uh, boards will need to operate in the future. And what we have, um, it might be slight, slightly tricky to share, and I understand that we're having a couple of technical issues, so apologies, but kind of in response to our uh, poll at the moment, we have a, a number of comments which are that um, boards will need to be much more inclusive, more resilient, much more open. Um, have they, there's a number of people that have uh, suggested the word diversity, and I think what we're hearing here is that that's just, just diversity in terms of uh, gender and ethnicity, but also intergenerational. And I think this is really important. And um, I know that earlier on, we were talking about this being a very global agenda. And this morning I was chit chatting with some uh, colleagues in Singapore and actually a lot of the themes that you're talking about in terms of engaging the younger people, Antoine are playing out in Singapore too. And I think we see very similar approaches to these governance issues as we look around the world. And have the idea of um, being science-based and much more aligned to rapid turnover is one that comes up quite a lot. And I have uh, found my way into the chat function, so now I can also see that there's um, a, a lively conversation emerging there. So thank you for your questions. Do continue to share those um, pieces of information. But just before we uh, come to turn to your questions, um, Carol, perhaps I can come back to you um, and then to Philippe and then back to Antoine, just to um, touch on some of the key reflections that you have about um, the competencies and the capabilities and characteristics that will be needed at the board for them to be successful, successful on this agenda. So Carol, can I uh, invite you just to offer some reflections? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I think just carrying on the theme of diversity and reflecting on some of the comments and feedback from uh, the audience uh, around the table on this, um, I think it's important um, to have diverse thinking in particular. Clearly, um, people from diverse traditional backgrounds, whether it's gender or ethnicity, uh, bring something to the table because of their different experiences and, and life experiences. Um, uh, but I think it's actually about the diversity of thinking, which is important because that would uh, help increase the quality of the debate um, and uh, to include uh, different, uh, you know, thinking from different generations is even better. So an example is that I sit on the board of Breeden Group PLC. It's uh, the largest construction materials uh, group in the UK. Um, construction is one of the hardest to abate uh, sectors. Um, and what the board did last week, for example, it's, it's one of the most diverse boards I've sat on, um, uh, but it's open to uh, ideas from younger generations. So last week we went to Derbyshire to visit um, a, a quarry, a cement quarry. Um, at first I thought it would be very traditional. We'll simply be looking at um, operators who would be with their diggers, etc. I was quite bowled over when we went into a state-of-the-art sort of laboratory where there were lots of young postdoctorate chemical engineers and process engineers and they were very fine up. Why do you want to work for a company which 
basically dealing with quarries and cement. And they said that they saw this as an opportunity to make change. And they were really involved in finding solutions to alternative construction materials, recycled concrete, and working with other um, organizations to try and help make the change. So they were the change agent within a sector that you would think, my goodness, you know, we might as well just um, forget about construction, but that's not really feasible. So they're trying to be practical and work with the grain rather than against it. And that's actually extraordinarily encouraging. And the good thing about the board was that we don't have the very young on the board itself, but we were very open to the ideas and actually had them round the board table to talk to us, etc. So that I think is one characteristic, which is really important for boards to be open uh, to different viewpoints. Um, other things would be sort of uh, systemic thinking, um, having uh, the, um, uh, you know, looking at things in a holistic way. Uh, what I touched on earlier, looking at the long term, not just the short term, um, and uh, thinking around the stakeholder wheel to see who are the people that you impact most, not purely uh, the shareholders, but the environment and so forth. And think about how honored we are to um, sit at a board, to have that position. It's not, we shouldn't say at the apex of the organization, but it is at the heart of the organization. And um, it is um, uh, a, an organ within the company that can actually set a strategic direction for the organization. So it is a responsibility as well as a privilege for to be on the board. And I think it, it means that we each have to take that responsibility quite seriously to try and be the change and to make a difference, not just for the company and its place in the world, but to make a difference to the lives of other people as well. And climate change is a really critical issue facing all of us at the moment. And Philippe, we have a question from uh, the floor, which kind of builds neatly into this approach. Yes. Um, what, what will it take for the board to act with urgency on this agenda? Will it take both to, sorry? Uh, act with urgency. How can yeah. we accelerate? Uh, I think there is a first, first point that we have not touched yet uh, in the conversation. Uh, it's very simply, uh, obviously, we, as Carol uh, said brightly, we can we can uh, we need an organization, we need awareness, etc. In the board to take that into consideration. Can come back to this in more detail after. But the first thing that the board should understand that they have no choice, because very simply, when you look at the responsibility, or we call that the duty of the board, uh, all across the world, you have always the same three main duties which is loyalty to the company, which means you have to act in the interest of the company, not in the interest of one stakeholder like shareholders or shareholder primacy, which was the, the previous century behavior. Now we have to, you have to, to act in the interest of the company. And then there is nothing more important than to take into consideration the deterioration of uh, natural capital and for example, climate change for a company. So if a board doesn't look at this, is negligent, is not doing his job. Uh, sometimes I say you can be president of the United States and be climate sceptical because at a certain point in time, you stand up, you say, hey, I don't believe in climate change. This is a Chinese hoax, but vote for me. And they voted for, for, for it. And then he was elected. But for a board, you have to take care of your company. And if you don't take this consideration, uh, this fact into consideration, you put your company in very dangerous water because you, you take bad decision. You don't look at the risk. You don't look at the real cost of uh, what this will put into your balance sheet. And you don't look at all the opportunities that you are wasting. So for me, the duty of the board anyway start there. After that, you have other duties as care and diligence, and uh, you cannot say you don't know 
which is very obvious now. Uh, the science is clear, the society is clear about that, so a board cannot be in denial anymore. So, and more importantly, perhaps we'll come back to that later, you are responsible of what the company is saying outside the world of the company as a board. You cannot be misleading. And uh, coming back to the center of, of, of our conversation this morning, if your company say, I am net zero, and uh, anybody comes, even me, and say, this is not true because of this, this, and this, the board is responsible for this. Why I'm saying this? Because as we have said before, the financial market is starting to take this in consideration to orient the flow of finance. So if you are misleading on a declaration like this and attracting funds and uh, wrongly attracting funds and investors, you are exposing yourself to a lot of consequence because sooner or later, somebody will challenge what you have said and board is personally responsible of this kind of communication. So if you look around the duties of the board, you find plenty of reason that the board has to take this issue into its own responsibility and make sure it's, it's positively tackled. Thank you. And Philippe, one of the questions that we have from the floor, and maybe you or Antoine might uh, respond, is kind of, to what extent a kind of performance on net zero playing out in um, remuneration? Are people being paid for good performance on net zero? Is it playing out in the finance system? Earlier we spoke of capital being on the move. And actually, are people being incentivized to pay packets to actually try to support this transition? Uh, do you want me to answer this one? Yeah, may, maybe we'll invite you, Philippe, and then invite Antoine after. Yes. Oh, uh, it's, it's a trend, obviously. But be, behind this, first, it's not wide enough. Huh? But uh, behind this question of remuneration, you have also the question of evaluation of real performance. Uh, sometimes I say that uh, we are publishing uh, wrong numbers or results or profit on which we are basing the remuneration or the dividends are not true because you don't take into consideration the cost of using nature for free, for example, and you are not use, you are not in reality uh, delivering really a result. So yes, we need to put uh, for individual performance criteria like respecting nature or going to uh, net zero for part of your business or having a climate target uh, in remuneration. But for me, the most important thing for a board is to start to check if the result that we are publishing is a real result. And uh, before we start to pay dividends, there, there is a conversation today in, uh, in France, you know that we, are, we will be electing our president in a few months. And, uh, and there was a consideration about companies that have received funds from the government to go through the, the, the COVID uh, issue and that are now, and they, and they are now paying huge dividends uh, to shareholders. So some parties, <laughs> some, some candidates are asking questions about this. Uh, how come they can pay dividends on this? Is this a real result? Uh, and the result has been affected by funds that the government have been, uh, have been uh, 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 giving to them. So this question about remuneration, dividends, bonus, etc., is a very tricky one and a very holistic one. Yeah, it's super important. And I know that a lot of the work that we're doing, Philippe, is in and around the space of okay, what do we actually value as society? Mm -hmm. I think there's a a stark contrast to the mobilization of funds in the post-COVID recovery versus the climate action. Yeah. I think this is um, a really interesting sort of conversation. And I think um, it's a big trade-off. And on this journey to net zero, we will encounter a lot of debates and a lot of trade-offs. Um, and uh, Antoine, I just uh, would like to come back to you, if I may, just to... Um, Hear some final reflections as we begin to come into our, um, our, our landing. Yeah. Antoine. Landing is with Carol. <laughs> oh, that's right. It's true. It's true. There's always a lot of aviation themes here. Antoine. 
Yeah, maybe to, to make the link between uh, my remarks on the generational aspects and those last questions around the relationship with the financial markets and whether they value or not uh, an environmental transformation today. I think if we look at the net zero, what's interesting is that as I view it, the net zero aspect is currently being uh, integrated uh, by financial actors. But the way they value it is maybe the wrong way. It's they ask whether there is a commitment, maybe it's a look at the time horizons, and they will give some good points to companies that have made a commitment um, to, to net zero and whether they are reporting about uh, a partial or a large part of their scope or not. But they don't really look at whether the company is currently doing efforts to adapt itself to what's needing tomorrow and to net zero society. So I think the way the financial market value today a uh, company's contribution to net zero is not a good proxy for what companies are actively uh, transforming themselves and will be adapted to, to tomorrow's world. So that's answering to your last question of if the board really wants to, to help his company to transform and to answer to the real, real world issues, he doesn't only have to see whether it's uh, well rated or not by the financial ESG uh, indices and, and so it has to ask other people whether it's, it's well contributing to the issues or not, and then see what are the investors that will value that and, and how, if he, if he's doing the right thing, he will be able to find the capital. But if he only looks at why financial markets are currently asking the environmental issue um, aspect, I think it will miss uh, what's the right thing to do. And on that aspect, I think the younger generation that can really, really help because if you select, when you are looking at your diversity, not only young people, but young people like willing to speak out and to look at the, at the real issues, they can show you what are the current issues with the offsets, what are the current issue of um, change in activities that might be labeled as greenwashing and at missing what is the right thing to do. So if you build that relationship of openness and frankness in the exchange, I think those younger generation, they can help you to, to see the gap between what invest, best ESG investors are currently asking and what are the real issues and the, the need for real change. Super, thank you, Antoine. I think that's a really powerful message. And I think there is a contradiction in some organizations between the financial markets, which are beginning to wake up and beginning to mobilize capital, and the incumbents who might have a much longer time horizon. And there's something which is very interesting about the time horizons and the ability of the finance system to move quickly. And I think boards are having to work differently with different traits and characteristics, drawing on diversity, building stronger relationships with broader stakeholder groups in order to anticipate and adapt to this changing context. We're just on time. So thank you, everyone. This has been really good. I, I'm sorry that we've had a couple of technical problems, um, but I'd just like to thank Philippe and uh, Antoine for sharing their excellent insights with us and for Carol uh, to join and um, help us think not just about aviation, but also about kind of some of those other industries. Hard, they're hard to abate because we collectively need to move forward. If we're to achieve our uh, net zero goals, then actually we all need to be moving forward. So thank you very much. I hope this has been an enjoyable hour and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. So thank you.